Audio is lined up. Audio is lined up. Does your face hurt from all the laughing? I don't think I have laughed that hard in ever. When I tell you, when people ask who's the funniest person on set, I would say who needs a one-man show? It is either Brian Detillo or Eric Martzoff. I mean, you don't lie. Just a great storyteller, um, just an amazing, amazing person, and uh, we just had a had an absolute blast. And he's such a delight. Oh just yeah, a great energy. Oh, he's awesome. So much fun. So much laughter. Yeah. I mean, literally, my face is. Sore. Yeah, you, you gotta love you. <laughs> get, you gotta love our guest today. It's it's Mr. Brian Detillo. So we're gonna cue him up here on the Zoom in just a second. Um, but yeah, we just can't say a, enough uh, nice things about the guy. He's 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 a talented actor. He's so professional. Brian and I have actually had some great scenes together over mm-hmm. the years. Uh, we've crossed paths. We've had an important storyline uh, over the years, and he's just been nothing but fun and entertaining and professional and amazing. And I just feel so grateful that he uh, spent almost an hour with us today. Mm-hmm. And I could have talked even longer. He said he's going to come back on too because I don't want to spoil the surprise. But there's something we're going to talk about on a separate podcast too. Uh, I can't wait to dive into with him in the near future, but let's let's focus on this one right now because <laughs> it's it's first. awesome. It was I, I think everyone's going to thoroughly enjoy themselves because I know we did. Um, so let's hop into it. Welcome everyone to the Freddie and Alyssa show. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe, like, comment, all that fun YouTube stuff. If you're watching on Facebook, be sure to like and follow. If you're listening on a platform such as iTunes and you'd like to leave a five star review, that would be awesome. All these likes, <laughs> comments, and subscriptions go a really long way to support the channel and we can't thank you enough um for doing so so uh uh, but yeah we've been putting up videos now for about two and a half years Mm -hmm. maybe even longer at this point and we just have a lot of fun connecting with people and learning and and sharing and uh that's exactly what we did today i think we we learned (laughs) i think we inspired and we definitely entertained so i think we might have hit all three pillars so thank you brian (laughs) detillo without further ado let's cue up brian detillo but yeah, no, we because what's the, we we did an event together in Colorado. I think that was the time we traveled, right? Me, you, Judy, and Wally. Yes, yes. And you had a boot on your foot. <laughs> <laughs> was that in my boot? Yeah, because I remember you dancing, and I was thinking to myself, he's got he's got some uh, some cojones oh, there surgery. to be dancing on his uh, broken foot, but you were going for it. I had plantar fasciitis, which was like the devil. I had never knew it, but it's the worst thing ever. And I had it in both feet. So after I got out of that boot, I actually was in another boot on my other foot. So, what so I was in a boot. Like I think I was in a boot for like eight months out of that year. I think I remember. Yeah, I remember being at work. So you had, and then what did you do when you shot? You just took it off and just, just felt. I took feet. it off and walked around and I felt like a nail was in my foot. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, you're good, right? You're good. And I'm like, you're all good. I'm good. Is the check good? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, I mean, what are you going to do? Not go to work because you have plantar spatiitis? You got to go to work. Yeah, there's really no replacing or taking a day off. That was always stressful for me knowing that, you know, we, we have a job where if you're not feeling well, I mean, there is no calling off. There is no, no. shape rate. There's, you know. Well, remember you had Bell's palsy at one point. I don't know if you remember that, but he had Bell's, Bell's palsy and he couldn't. I do remember that, bro. I do remember that. You know what? That was when Will, when you had a problem with our characters being together, you as uh, as Lucas. Right. And I totally, think. Totally. I totally remember that. And I had this great scene where you walked into someone. We're, we, you, we, I was like so excited to do the scene and I was so bummed that half of my face wasn't working, but we kind of shot it from my left side or right side and we I were remember. able to do it. But I was like kind of talking like weird and it was such an important scene. And I was like, what are the chances? Oh my Dude, you were such a pro that day. You manned up so hard and it looked great. I mean, I think a lot of it was, you know, maybe in your own head cause you were going through it. But what red dude, I mean, you just, you just fucking, Sorry, you bared down and just went through it. You know what I mean? So I don't know, man. You're one of the things I admire about you. You're tough as nails. Oh, tough nice, as man. nails and resilient, too, just like me. Yeah. Just like me, little guy. Just like me. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, you know, you, you've um, – I remember even when you had your daughter um, and uh, just showing up to work and you were just, like, not sleeping, but you power through and you always come with your great energy. 
anytime they asked me in Soap Opera Digest, I was like, who do you think would have a one-man show? I'm like, Datillo and Martsoff. They should oh, eat. Oh, Martsoff. Oh, dude, both Mark's of you. Off. And Galen. We just have such a – like, they should do a once-a-year comedy episode where we do the days of our lives like a sitcom or something just to, like, shock the fans but really showcase the talent, the comedic talent. That they should. They should do that. We used to do a primetime show once a year. Mm. And yeah, and we all got paid what the highest person got <laughs> on the show. So, oh, nice. so it was the coolest thing because not only did you get to find out who made the most on the show, but for one day you made as much as they did. <laughs> wow, gives you a little taste. Totally. I was like, sweet, someone's living. Cool. But <laughs> But yeah, I remember that. But primetime shows, definitely. That would be so cool to have like one a year where we're not our characters. We're just like, I don't know, showcase us in different, you know, in a different light, maybe like a talent show. So is that what it was yeah. that you guys did? No, I think they were like nighttime, like short term, not like a mini series, but like a two hour special okay. of days at night. But so did you play your character or no? That was my character. Oh, you were? Yes. Yes. That's cool. Yes, it was like days at night or something. Huh. I think there was like a, someone was getting killed. There was a stalker storyline, I think. I think that it happened twice since I've been there. I feel, yeah. they could, I feel like they could do a, a Days of Our Lives movie or something. Um, not in maybe as high production of, you know, they don't need to spend millions on it but these days with the peacock service or nbc.com or online you don't really need to compete with another time slot you can just make something that you'd imagine two three million people would watch oh totally kind of with all the avenues to put shows on now i mean it could go anywhere yeah yeah, yeah what, that's what, a great idea what do you see what do you see the future because you you've, you've kind of been through the roller coaster of days <laughs> Um, cause wasn't it at its height in like the eighties, nineties, and then it kind of dipped and now it's kind of been not plateaued, but it's, it's definitely been a Different. rough decade. Um, how, how do you, what do you see the future of days or the future of soaps? Do you, do you feel like it's going to go forever or what do you, how, what's your insight? I don't know if it could go forever, but I feel like we need them, even though they're not in the same light as they used to be. Cause in the eighties, when I started watching, I used to like want to stay home from school to watch days just because like patch was, you know, on his harmonica and he had the thing over his eye. And I was like, why am I crying watching this? This is such a cool show. I want to be an actor because of the show. So in the eighties, it was really cool because it was like, we had very few outlets to kind of watch drama unless you went to the theater or, or at night. So I don't know. And then in the nineties, when I got on, it became a little bit more, commercial you know a little bit more you know i don't know maybe watered down or i don't know maybe it lost its flair that it once had you know it was a time period thing and then it, it changed in 2000s where it started tackling a lot of issues you know a lot of cool cool things need to be addressed through society through soaps so i think soaps need to they're they're still you know applicable to life now just not in the same way and i think they're necessary but just different. I don't know. It'll always ref reflect where we are in society in a way. But I think without that, it would be, something would be missing. I don't know. It's like one of those things, if you don't have it, you take it for granted that, oh, that used to be cool. There used to be soap operas. Remember soap operas? I just don't see it dying out. I see it being needed still. So then that's so cool that you were a fan of the show. And that I was. That made you want to be an actor, though? Like, that did. was... And then you got on the show? I mean, that's kind of insane. I know, it's weird. I used to watch it with my grandma, and uh -huh. it was her favorite show. So then she would just be like, don't talk to me till the commercial. And then she'd throw something at me if I asked a question. So then when I got an audition for it, it was her show. She was like, you're going to be on my story. I know it. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to get it. You know, a lot has to happen for me to get the part. She's like, no, no, you're going to get it. You're going to get it. I actually got it and it was it was cool. But um yeah, it was it was a cool thing that she got to experience just before she, you know, she recently passed away. So she got to see me on her story, which is almost better than visiting her, you know? Of course. <laughs> there there's a lot of uh I feel even in my family, um, it kind of helped me being on TV a couple times a week. 
that my grandma and my aunt and my parents got to, you know, not see me, but see me. And, and I oh, think yeah. it really uh, kept everyone connected. Um, how did your, your whole family react when you were on the soap? Did you feel um, like, pe did people treat you any differently? Did you, um, what was your experience with just like, as you climbed in your, in your career? It, through my family, how my family treated me? Yeah, like did they keep the, treating you the same and keep you humble? Or did people kind of change a little bit and got a little weird? Or how, what was your experience like? I think everyone kind of wants to treat you the same, but they all kind of like just downplay that you're on TV. <laughs> or they'll just tease the hell out of you. You know, they'll tease you for it a lot. I, got, I get teased a lot by my brother. Bro, I can't even turn on the TV without seeing you with your shirt off, man. I don't need to see that, you know. It's, it's not like I, I was sharing a room with you for, for 15 years and now I got to see you naked kissing some girl. My brother was kind of, you know, razzing me about it. My sister was an actress or is an actress. So she always, you know, would say, you know, just don't try not to be so soapy, you know, try, try to, you know, make it real, make the lines real. And, and then like, I would say, well, did you see the show that I was on? She's like, yeah, I saw it. I saw it. It was good. It, it was good. It was good. And I was, <laughs> I'm like, oh no, I'm terrible. And she's like, just watch it so you're not so singy songy, you know, like make it like you're really talking. And I was like, oh, no, because I think I was bad for like the first three years and I didn't know it. I might still be bad, but right now, I mean, I don't care at this point. <laughs> so I am. I am who I am. It's not going to change. I'm 49. I think I've been on this shirt 28 years. I, I don't think it's going to change. But my sister is very, you know, she's a pro and she's good at what she does. So she's constantly trying to make me better. And my mom the same way too. You looked good. You, you look good on the show. Yeah. Are you watching your weight? <laughs> yeah. yeah, mom, I'm watching my weight. Well, I just, I just, I think, you know, if, you know, it, if you should be aware of certain things because I don't want to offend you. But you already did offend me. You <laughs> knocked me out. Shoot me now. <laughs> I get the truth from my family. I get the truth it, whether I want to hear it or not. And my wife is very funny too because my wife watches the show so i have to sit here at night and watch my wife watch days while i'm trying to like go to sleep or try to eat my dinner and she's like i just want to see this one thing and i'm i'm not on at that point because i wasn't on so i have to watch you know i have to watch other other people all your other there. friends oh. act it's it's strange watching days because you know everyone. It's different if there's a show where you have a buddy on or, or, or a, a girlfriend or something. You're like, oh, sure. in that scene, you see a friend that takes you out. But when you watch Days, <laughs> it's ridiculous. I'm like, I know every person. I know everything that was probably going on right before action. Oh, but totally. it's just, it's really hard to really get into. But there are certain scenes that I, that I watch, like our, our fellow castmates, where I'm just super proud of the work they did. You know, there's certain scenes where you just go, wow, great job. Like that, I know how hard that was and it just came out so beautiful. So there are moments like that that I'm affected and I'll get teary eyed and stuff. But for the most part, I just watch and I'm like, you know, we know all these people. We know, we know what goes on. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm thinking of what's happening like behind the cameras. Like, did that guy miss, miss his shot? You know, is that a rack focus? Was that supposed to be like that? You know, is that lighting or is that, is, is that a shadow? I'm like, oh, he's critiquing the, the, uh, the small angles. of it. But my daughter watches the show. And she's, she's into Ben and she's six years old and she's talking about Ben this and Ben that. And I'm like, stop talking about Ben. <laughs> <laughs> and she'll imitate Cassie saying Ben, like Cassie kind of has that voice. Oh know, yeah. Ben, oh, ben, what are you doing, Ben? That Ben, Ben. And uh, my daughter does that now. She'll walk around going Ben, Ben, Ben. So I got to hear, I got to hear that. <laughs> it's so funny. How's your uh, how's your family and everyone uh, hanging in there with uh, this crazy? It, I can't believe I'm saying this. It's you know it's actually been six months now officially since the shutdown. It kind of feels believe. normal now, which is odd. Scary odd. Yeah. Scary how's, odd. How's your little one handling it? Are you able to kind of share what's going on, or what does she think of it? Is she too young to understand, or how have you been kind of sharing? Do you have her wear like a mask and stuff, or? Well, yeah. I mean, when she leaves the house, she has to wear a mask and all that, you know, wherever she goes. But she's not out that much, unfortunately, you know. But even, like, to ride her little bike, she's got to be with the mask. And it's kind of sad, you know. But um, 
and she's on Zoom all day long at school. And I'm thinking, is that healthy? She's been in this chair since eight in the morning and it's 2.30, like that might be too much for a six year old. And then they give them like these glasses to wear that like block out the blue light. Huh. Is that really doing something? I mean, she's still staring at a screen for eight hour, whatever, five, six hours a day. So I think it's, it's really hard on her that that's her norm, you know? I hope that, that that doesn't continue. I hope it's just a bad memory one day where she's like, I remember that kind of. But, you know, hopefully it doesn't last that long. It's just, it's crazy. Did, did you ever have to do any homeschooling with her when this all first began? Or has it solely been like the teacher on Zoom and you can kind of go around and do your thing? No, no. In the beginning, she, I, we had to do it, you know, because she was caught in between and they didn't really have anything set up yet. But luckily my wife is a substitute teacher and she's so good with her. So it's kind of like having a teacher in the house. So that that was, you know, that's been a a huge plus. Oh my gosh. Well, hopefully things go back to normal-ish in the near future. You know, we'll see. And my son moved out of the house. So I'm really happy. (laughs) (laughs) When did he move out? He moved in with his girl uh, two weeks ago. Really? Yeah. And the first week he totaled his car. Uh, just like again. Dad. again. Oh, don't you no. don't you have a few totaled vehicles in your day? And I want to hear the speed bump story because I've heard some stories about the speed bumps at days or birthday. I built those speed bumps. <laughs> what are you talking about? Those speed bumps are there because of me. Yeah, it's because I almost ran over Ben Silverman. So once once I almost ran him over there, like put speed bumps in. So you're responsible for the speed bumps. I, I think I shared that one day, like years ago in an interview. I was like, I think Brian Detillo is responsible for the, <laughs> the Burbank studio speed bumps from racing around. I had a dude come up to me on the crew and he was like, Hey man, how was your weekend? And I was like, great. I had a great weekend. How was your weekend? He goes, my weekend sucked. I had to put in speed bumps all weekend because of you. And I was like, what? He's like, I had to put it. I had to pour concrete because of you all weekend. I had to put in those speed bumps. And I was like, bro, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry about that. He's like, just slow down, man. Slow down. But I was young, Freddie. I was young and stupid. Have you slowed down since when you go over the speed? I have, yeah. Well, I realize it's stupid to spend thousands of dollars on fast cars when you can only go so fast on the street anyway. True. It's like really true. fun. Because what, what age did you uh, kind of start getting um, – because like what did you – well, actually, I want to back up real quick, and then we'll get to that, because I'm curious about your um, – when you grew up, you, you didn't – you were born in the Midwest, but you went to Beverly Hills High. Yeah. We did a little yeah, stalking. A little light stalking. And I was like, I didn't know uh-huh. Dillo went to Beverly Hills. How, how was Beverly Hills High? Is it like the show where everyone's just ripped and they're models and they drink by the pool? and It was kind of crazy, dude. Yeah. It was kind of, was kind of crazy. Yeah, the student parking lot is a lot nicer than the teacher parking lot. <laughs> I can yeah. imagine. You all the rides, you're like, man, look at all those nice cars. Oh, and that's the teacher's parking lot with like all the broken down cars and stuff. Uh, no, it was cool. I grew up in, um, I, I was born in Kankakee, Illinois. And then my parents were divorced when I was two. So I, we moved down to Florida and my mom got a job at the National Enquirer. <laughs> so we spent like two or three years in West Palm Beach and then she got promoted and we moved out to California and she was a reporter. So it was kind of cool. You know, we never knew who she was talking to on the phone or, you know, what her next job was or why she was leaving the house. You know, she was like scouting out celebrities and like hanging out in clubs and stuff. Um, oh, that was, my gosh. That's how I got into acting is she, she kind of understood how it worked out here early in like the late seventies, early eighties and got me and my sister into it. And my brother was living with my dad in the Midwest. And then he came out to live with us. And then we bounced back uh, from Beverly Hills to West Palm like twice because my mom kept getting promoted and then she quit and then we stayed out in California. Oh. So mostly in California I grew up. Okay, so this yeah. feels like home. And then so you were kind of around the industry just being in LA oh, and yeah. then you, oh, yeah. when did you when did you actually start 
like making money and having that next jump in your career? Because you were young when you, you had success early. Yeah, well, my best friend, Alex Turk, who I just talked to recently, his mom, Pat Turk Lee, was a producer of a show called Not Necessarily the News on HBO. And it was like a political satire show that uh, uh, was developed by the people who did Real People, which was also an older show. And Byron Allen was one of the hosts on that. <laughs> I'll get back to Byron Allen. <laughs> but um, so I got I got to start on not necessarily the news a couple times. And then um, I was on a Disney show called Wish Upon a Star. And it was about uh, kids like what they wanted to do when they grew up. And my thing was comedian. And so I went to the improv and did an act with Byron Allen. And and we did an improv when I was like in, I don't know, I was I could have been like fifth, sixth grade, something like that. So I was like 11 or 12. So I got into it around that age. And then I was in acting class early. Uh, Shannon Doherty tried to kiss me once in acting class and I like pushed her away. Uh, Chris, Christy Clark, Christy Clark was in my acting class. And, and Diane Hill Harden on, on Van Nuys, the young actor space. So that's where we all kind of came up. And that's where I, I got into acting. My sister wanted to be the actress and I didn't want to do it, but they bribed me with a, uh, football and baseball cards. So I, I would go and they would like buy me cards after. But then I started working and she hated me because I didn't even want to do it. Isn't that always how it works though? Always. Totally. Oh my gosh. So then you came out here and you've been on days for quite a amount of time. I'm yeah, since 93. What was it like for you when you first started working there? Would you say with the sense of being like known and being stopped versus today, like with social media, do you see any sort of difference? Oh yeah, huge difference. Um, yeah. What, just as far as being recognized? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think people now are, are more used to it and they kind of be like, oh, you come out on Days of Our Lives? And I'm like, <laughs> Yeah, I come out on that. And they're like, oh, man, uh, wh who are you? Who are you? Who are you, that guy? Wh what's your name? Uh, Lucas. Oh, yeah, yeah, Lucas. You're Lucas, man. You're, you're pretty cool, man. I like that. And, and, but, and, and it's more approachable now, you know? Mm -hmm. But back then when I first started, bro, it was almost like rock star-ish. Like people hyperventilating, people crying, people being overwhelmed by seeing you. You know, we used to get... We used to get fan mail, like envelopes with letters in it. Wow. <laughs> it was so weird, you know? You didn't get a like on like Twitter or Instagram or a mention or a tag. You got like real letters. Um, and when you went to travel on your PAs, the PAs were packed. So, you know, now they're, they're a lot more intimate and we do like more intimate things with fewer people. But back then it used to be like, you're in the middle of the mall with like 3000 people and they can't handle the crowd and you have to like leave early cause you're causing like a fire hazard or something. <laughs> oh my gosh. So things have changed, but it used to be a lot more fanatical. I think. That's kind of cool though, to have been able to experience that. It's so, it know. was cool. <laughs> how did you, how did you handle the, uh, the coming into to fame and, and money as a young kid? Did you have like a careless, uh, a couple of years or decade, and then what kind of changed the route to this responsible father on a Zoom podcast today? Dude, I can't believe God blessed me with all that money at that age. Why would he do that? Like at 21, single, hanging out with my buddies, and he's giving me like a million dollars a year back then. It's like, what? So I was going to Vegas a lot. I was blowing a lot of money and then taking my friends out. Sky Bar got so sick of me. I was going to Sky Bar like twice a week. I was like Mr. Sky Bar. I had my own little table, my own little section in the corner and the top. It was terrible. I, I spent way too much money. Like I'm talking like five, $6,000 a night just uh -huh. on the for me and my friends, you know, go to Sushi Roku and have, you know, $1,500 meal, $2,000 dinner, and then go out after and then run up a tab for 3000 So I was doing that a lot and not thinking that it was going to end. You know, I had friends living with me back then and they were like, 
they were like, I'll give you a hundred bucks a month. And I'd be like, all right, that's cool. And they had like their own room and like, and they were putting their name on the milk. Like, that's my milk, dude. And I'd be like, bro, I let you live here for like a hundred bucks a month. And, like, that's my milk. and I'd be like, bro, really? So I don't know. I think a lot of friends, cause I was just generous and fun. They were like, dude, I'm on board with that. So why not? I would have been, but then you realize, you know, that it's not forever. And you know, you have to stop when your accountant calls you and he's like, uh, I just want to ask you a question. And you're like, yeah. They like, do you think you're rich? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, nah, I think I'm pretty good. He's like, no, you're not rich at all. You're in the black every month. You owe money every month. And I'd be like, how? I just made $25,000 this month. And he'd be like, because you spent 28. Oh. <laughs> I'd be like, how do I do that? <laughs> so you have, to, you have to live and learn, unfortunately, and not, you know, now I'm like a, you know, now I like recycle cans and shit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's, it's a, it's a bizarre and, and it's crazy too. Cause I, you, you probably, cause I, I got my start when I was like 22, 23, but soaps were different. So I don't right. think it was anywhere near the same amount of money as it would have been probably at your age. Um, when you started, um, but even the people who were massively successful, it's, it's kind of just a disaster and a perfect cocktail for things to go wrong when people aren't developed yet. They don't really understand. You feel you're invincible, you know, and you just like, it was a weird, we had a shift, you know, like in our mid twenties where I was like, wait a second, I got to get my shit together and start making totally. better decisions. And I'm glad we did because as days two started ticking along, I was like, every year felt like a gift where I was like, <laughs> how long this is going to last for me or the show. So I better start preparing for this to end one day. And uh, I'm glad that we did. And um, I was even, I even, I bring you up a lot. You've made a huge <laughs> impact on me. There's this, uh, really? you know, yeah, you told me you go, anytime I look at the script and I see that there's an airport <laughs> on the sunset, I know I'm on that plane. <laughs> and when we saw the script, when we were leaving, I just thought of you when it said, <laughs> we're going to Arizona to start a business. I go, oh, no, oh. don't me about this. We're going to be on that plane to Arizona. <laughs> so I kind of had a heads up. I was like, we're probably going to be gone for a while or whatever. But, um, but yeah, I forget the whole point I was saying about that. But, yeah, just basically just <laughs> learning to prepare for the ups and downs of this crazy, crazy business. I mean, it's all about being resilient. I mean, that's the only thing you can do. And it's, it's so unpredictable and you can't say where it's going to go. But like you said, each day is a gift and you just try to make the most out of each scene you're given. And, and you, I act like each one's my last because I'm, you know, I kind of used to that. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, you know what? This, this may be it. I'm going to really do good on this one. I'm going to study hard for this scene. But yeah, you want to make the most out of it. You know, you want it to, to you want to leave a mark. Oh my gosh. And speaking of stories too, because I've heard a couple, Freddie says that you can talk about alien stories all day long. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm really bad at that. I, I'm addicted to it. Yes. Me, but like, tell me what you think. Because he mentioned one time that you, like, you think they live amongst us maybe? Oh, what do you mean Whoa. maybe? Of course they do. <laughs> Where do you think they live? <laughs> They, 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 I think that there, there are probably about six to eight different alien races that live on this earth. Most of them like subterranean. Okay. And they're just like collecting data on us or what, what's your, what's your theory? Are they from different planets? Are they from the future? Is this a simulation? Get us with it. We got to know. It's a tough thing. I mean, it's a tough thing. I think, I think that they were here. I think that we're a product of kind of their tinkering. And I think they are scientists first before like astronauts and stuff. So maybe genetically in a weird way, they're kind of manufacturing us for some big purpose in the future. I don't know. I think, I think that, um, only because of stuff that's happened to me do I think this. I don't just read a book and think this. I actually kind of like had certain things happening in my life that make me think, dude, that's not normal, you know, to have loss of time or to be like, 
um, having dreams that don't seem like dreams or to be in and out of a consciousness in, in a lot of weird ways and then seeing a lot of things and having a lot of weird things happen. And then you investigate, oh, I wonder what that is. I wonder if anyone else has had that experience. So then when you read about it, you're like, oh, that actually did happen to me too and it happened to this guy. So there, and there's such similarities in an incident, like in an incident, you'll have like loss of time. Like when I was in Culver city, I was sleeping. I was minding my own business. I had just gotten the job in 1993 and I was trying to sleep before work day. And I went to sleep and I saw uh, the clock and it was like, you know, 940 something, 945. So I was like, oh, I'll get some good sleep. You know, it's a pretty good amount of time I can get. So as soon as I was asleep, I saw outside my window these beings floating. And I remember thinking that's impossible because the garage to the underground parking is there. There's nowhere for them to stand. How come, how, why are they outside my window? And then <laughs> they flew through my window, through my fish tank, like a ghost would and then become, became solid in my room. And there were like gray aliens, like three or four of them, all different sized. Some were a little smaller, some were a little taller. And I, I was thinking, I was like, God, dear, how did they do that? How did they float through that? I was like impressed with it almost. I was like, that's pretty cool how they did that. And I'm thinking this whole time, this is a dream. So I'm kind of going along with it. So they take me out of my bed and put me on this, put me in this room is the next thing I know. And it's kind of like a circular room where I can see the roundness of the walls. And the furniture was kind of a trip because it was like embedded in the actual place. Like it was a part of it, like a mold would be like where you would sit. And they sat me down and, uh, and they brought like these little babies over to me in diapers. And I remember thinking, this is so freaking weird. And there were other humans sitting, waiting for the same thing as I was doing, like waiting to be introduced to these babies, these, these toddlers. And I remember thinking this, there was a diaper on this one and he was kind of muscular and his face was a little bit different than normal, a human face. And as it approached me, it was kind of apprehensive and it was being encouraged by these gray aliens to come toward me. But it was, it was a little apprehensive. And then it kind of like wanted to hug me. So when it got close enough, I noticed that its eyes, there was no white in its eyes. It was all black. There was no white part to its eyes. And it threw me. And that, that, that and the fact it was like pump for like a six-year-old. I was like, damn, this, this is a pump six-year-old. You know, it's this, you've done some reps, bro. And, and I freaked out. I, I kind of fought it. And, and I woke up. Now, what seemed like a 20 minute dream for me, and I woke up and I was in a pool of sweat and my underwear was at my ankles. <laughs> but I was, I was sweating like I had went swimming, you know, like I was drenched. And I was like, that was not a dream because it seemed like about 20 minutes, but I, it, you know, the next thing I know it was almost seven in the morning. So there was a loss of time that I could not count for. So I called my mom because I just moved out of my house and my mom working for the National Enquirer for years has her alien stories down. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. so I'm like, mom, you got, you're going to trip off this. This she's like, no, no, I don't want to hear it. I have something to tell you. I want to tell you about my dream first. And I said, no, no, I want to tell you about my dream first. Seriously. She's like, no, no, no. I said, no, no, no. So she said, I right, go tell me about your dream first. So I told her and, and she goes, okay, Brian, Last night, you came to me in a dream. You knocked on my front door and wanted to, and you had a baby with you. And the reason why I didn't let the baby in my house was because the baby had all black eyes. <laughs> and I, 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 I had just told her the story about this black eyed baby. And she's like, no, 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 I want to tell you first. So after telling her, she's like, the same dream happened to me you came to me with this child and I wouldn't accept it because of its eye color, because of the fact it had totally black eyes. So I was doing a lot of research on alien abduction and hybrid aliens because I felt like that's what it was. I felt like honestly it was a hybrid. It was like half human, half alien. 
So maybe they're trying to incorporate themselves through us some way to be accepted, or maybe it's a genetic thing where they're still trying to alter their own DNA. I don't know, but I know it seems to be genetically motivated. Yeah. <laughs> My God. And also, this is like so crazy too. But And that's just the grays. I don't talk about the Nordics yet because the Nordics are doing the same thing. It's like a taller alien and they wear blonde wigs and white lab coats. And there have been a lot of abductions recently about the Nordics. And then there's the reptilians. Of course, the reptilians, they're energy gatherers. They actually gather energy. And and they 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 steal energy and they're a dim- most most aliens are dimensional beings. They can float from the fourth, fifth, sixth dimension down to the third dimension where we are. So a lot of it's technology that gets it in and out of dimensions. But to stay here, they can't handle our atmosphere or our direct sun, so they have to live underground. And that's why they cavernize all these mountains. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. I love this so much. And that's where they're living. And so when we see ships, the ships aren't necessarily coming from outer space. They're just coming from oceans or underground facilities that they have. So, and, and now that, that, that we have uh, obtained enough technology, I think that we can also, we also have a space force that has UFOs that are U.S. So, you know, there's the U.S. angle of aliens, and then there are alien ufos so i think those are those are ufos you would see some of them might be u.s ufos usa what are your thoughts on area 51 obviously well i i definitely think it happened yeah in 1947 i mean chandler this is one of the things i explained when i did that uh when i did chandler's class at ucla he was in a, a class called ghost psychics and aliens but when I spoke at the class, it was the next year, and he wasn't in it. But I went to UCLA and gave an hour and a half lecture on it. What? How <laughs> that happen? Chandler's old, Chandler's old teacher. And it was so cool because the whole time people are looking at me like, <laughs> wait, what? <laughs> wait, what? <laughs> so it was cool to kind of get it out and get it off my chest because I've done a lot of research on it. and. Yeah, I think you, uh, Roswell definitely happened. I think we got technology. There was definitely a cover-up. Um, it definitely triggered um, a lot of things in society after that technology-wise, computer-wise. And, um, and, and, yeah. and do you think people are hiding it just in the sense that they don't know its full capacity or don't think we can handle it? Or like if, if, if we really do have more information about different dimensions or alien what, what what do you feel the reason is that it's not just like known? Well, it threatens a lot of people who are making a lot of money now on society the way it is. So if you kind of mess with, let's say energy, you know, and you take Edison out of the picture or the DWP, it's a lot of money. And, and that, you know, that's kind of why we don't have technology that we should have now because it's making money for people that don't want their money to go away. Uh-huh. And if we get disconnected any minute, then you know it's just- <laughs> <laughs> Oh no, I'm like scared now. <laughs> but it's, it's interesting to watch how some of these huge companies control all that, where they're basically waiting until they can own the market, where a lot of these cars now that were gas are now moving to electric, but it had to go in such probably a slow manner so that they could still maintain the market share. And then you have something like the Marlboro Company. I forget what their umbrella company is, but they bought the Jewel. Oh, yeah. and, and so they took, so I think Marlboro took over a hu- the biggest uh, vape company. Right. So they fought against it, fought against and then eventually just bought it. And now they own that market share. So it seems like it, they're just like years behind, but we have to keep waiting for these big companies to find their share before they allow innovation to happen. They say that every year since 1947, it's 10 times every year that we're off the truth. So if it's been 60 years, it's like 600 years of technology in the future is kind of where we're at. So Uh (laughs) we just get a lot of the trickle down, you know, we get a lot of the, 
the stuff Here's an electric us vehicle happy. for you and free shipping. <laughs> and totally. <laughs> Here's a battery that goes 500 miles. Have a great time. Yeah, but you still got to drive cross country right. and just teleport. We'll, we'll keep that for later. Exactly. Yeah, you can't use the teleport machine. Oh my goodness. Oh my God. It's crazy because I remember hearing um, years ago that if you have O negative blood, it's like alien blood. And I have that. Uh oh. <laughs> so that explains a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good because you've been genetically designed to handle, right. handle certain things better than a normal person would. Yeah. You're not susceptible. I can't have any lab coats around here because then. Oh, you'd be the Nordic with the blonde and the. Um, we, I, and I'd love I um I want I want to chat real quick about about days um but I would love if maybe in the next like couple months or some if you have like a free hour if we could do a whole segment just on your knowledge of aliens I would absolutely oh love my god have any interest in sharing. Dude, I have books. I have pages and pages. Yeah. I have diagrams. I have things I could refer to. I have posters and like, I could show you like what they look like and where they're from. And it's, it's so cool. It's so cool. Oh, dude, I would love to do a Brian Dottillo alien special on the show. That would be <sighs> awesome. Cause I'm really, I'm truly interested in, my mind's just open to um, just every possibility. Because I, I just feel like there's so many miracles in the world. There's so many coincidences. There's just so many, there's no way you can just kind of walk around and think that this was all by accident. Like there's something else that's so much bigger. And this is what changed my, my life forever. I heard a quote once, and this is what like literally changed the way I thought about everything. That you have dogs and cats living in a world surrounded by the internet, but they don't have the mental capacity to even come close to understanding what the internet is but they live in a world that it exists every day and controls everything and they have no clue and i go well why would it stop at dogs and cats i bet you we're in a place where it's around us and we just don't have the mental capacity to understand that complex of a theory yet or real or real life it's a great analogy and if it exists on that level it definitely exists on a higher level so yeah. that same principle applies it goes up it's the same thing so you're, you're right on it. I've always felt that way. If it's like this in this small area like here, then it's got to be applicable to other things. It's not just, you know, we all take our turn of being in the dark. So I think that, you know, the key to that is not to be in the dark and understand what's really going on. But a lot of people think I'm just totally crazy, which is fine, <laughs> which is fine. But I just wish that some of the things that happened to me happened to them. Sure. That would, that would, that would be cool for me because then you don't have to beat anyone over the head. You just say, see, I told you how crazy that was. Well, we just watched a documentary not too long ago. And that was one of the, the things that people say, we didn't want this to happen to us. We didn't want to be abducted or yeah. we didn't, because no one believed, everyone like called them crazy. They had to like leave town. It was because Unsolved Mysteries. Yeah, yeah, but they had all the evidence in this and it was like, it's amazing. So like, I, I believe in it. It's just, but I can see how people are like, oh, this is so crazy. But I, I just don't let it dictate my life in too much of a way, but I'm definitely open to it. I love hearing the stories. And I think as technology grows, we're going to learn a lot. And, um, you know, one other thing that I heard that was pretty interesting, I might butcher this, but um, when they were talking about space exploration, they said the, the, um, uh, we've only expo explored the equivalent to a cup of water of our ocean of what we know about space. Well, <laughs> and I go, hey, come on. oh, <laughs> well, that's Well, that's bad. what they tell us. That's what they tell us so they can feel safe with not telling us everything. So it, it, what I, my big question is, where does the line stop? Like, where does the, the information stop? Like, what level of government knows what? How, how, how come we have to say that NASA only has a certain understanding of a certain level? When we all know they understand more. They just don't tell us. Mm -hmm. Like, it's like 
Same thing with the Days of Our Lives storyline. You know, there's more than we could tell the fans. <laughs> but we can only tell them so much. So let's tell them we know that much, and that's it. It's the same thing with the, with the government's doing to, you know, to us. What, what a great pivot. <laughs> what a great segue. <laughs> yeah. So, with that softball pitch, let's <laughs> knock it out of the park. What, um, what's been going on with Days? Um, and like we talked about before, depending on when we release this, uh, let's just talk freely. And if we can release it, if not, we'll cut it and we'll put it up separate once the news comes out. Um, what, uh, what's been going on? Um, have, are you back to work? And forgive me for not knowing if you, did, did you, were you, were you working like right before this was shut down or were you on a pause or were you, I, I can never keep track cause we're all, there's so many people and no, yeah, yeah. I was definitely working right when we shut down and there was a really good storyline developing and I was like, now there has to be a pandemic. I finally get like a cool thing to play and now we're going to get this. So I was mad when it stopped. I was like, man, I was on a roll. You know, you know, when you're on a roll and you, you know, there's a good thing coming and there's a good buildup and, and they kind of, they do, they take their time with it and do it right and give you a chance to really sink your teeth into it that's what was happening. And I was like, okay, no. So now that it's, that we're back, I've only been back, you know, recently just, um, I've had one day there. Okay. And so one day of the past, I think we started last month. So this month, so one day this month. Um, and then I have a couple next month. But so, they didn't continue, they didn't continue your dope storyline. Well, they did, they did, but they slowed it down. It was coming to a good peak and then they slowed it down and, and plugged a different storyline in. So then they, that one kind of meets mine. So I think you're getting two angles of the same situation. So right now they're on the opposite angle. And then when it comes back to me, then I think there's a, a good run there. And so what was it like going to work now that, you know, there are a lot of different safety protocols? What was that? What's so, that? so weird. Real, I'm it sure. was so weird. I mean, they do a great job. I mean, they're very thorough. They really are. So if you go back, you should be, or when, or I don't know, you know, but you should feel really secure and safe to know what they're doing to kind of make sure that it's a safe environment. So you get there and, you know, they're right there to greet you right before you get in and you report right to medical and they test you immediately on the spot. And they send you back to your car and it's like 20 minutes, you, you find out positive or negative. And then if you're good, you go in and you get a credential that only allows you to go in certain areas. Huh. So it's like zone A, B, or C. So there are certain areas you can't even go into. And then when you get into your room, you're the only one allowed in your room. You could take your mask off when you're in your room, but you have to leave your mask on every other time. Um, it's really cool because you get your blocking right before you shoot the scene and there's only one rehearsal. So there's not a lot of time to time out your lines with your movement, which was kind of tricky because in the past, if you have a big scene, you know, sometimes you, you, you remember certain lines off certain moves, you yeah. know, I, I cross here and that's when that line is, you know, mm -hmm. I have to say that part out and then I turn to you. So a lot of that changed to where it's just you know, 50-50, you don't have to keep distance because you're both been cleared. That's way better. Cause I've seen some other soaps supposedly, I don't, I didn't look too much into it, but they're using like mannequins, mannequins and other things and it just seems a little odd. So I think it's nice that they're doing it. Well, what, what happened to dry block then? Are you able to get out earlier? Or, I mean, what time's your call time then? Call time's the same, it's a, it's a little earlier cause you have to go through the medical process. Uh. So that part is earlier, but you leave earlier because you're not, you're not doing dry block. You're not, you know, so you start, there's, no, you, there's so, no wasted time. I used to think dry block was the biggest waste of time ever. I'm like, why do we do this? I could do, just tell me where to stand. I'll do it right now. But I think, you know, it's certain scenes I do like to know, but with these it's chop chop and one rehearsal and then you go to tape and then. So the shoot day starts at 7.30 then? 
I think we still sh start shooting at 845 because that's how long it takes everyone to get through medical. Mm. Uh, so the blocking is just now medical rather than the... But so the scenes tend to go quicker, it seems like. Interesting. Do you know Because Albert's not coming down to set to talk to you and give you everything. It's all over the PA. So there's a lot of things that we used to wait for that aren't delaying you. And would you say that there are a lot less actors on set now at one time, right? Yes. Yes. Not a lot of atmosphere. Um, just you and your scene partner. Wow. Um, because that's what I was thinking about too with the, uh, depending on how long this goes, I mean, if this ends up being like a new thing for the next year, because um, Alyssa and I are moving to, to Florida and I was always wondering with days, I wonder if this is going to change the schedule drastically because if they're only going to work my kid, because I always thought if you're going to work Freddie or work Brian, why test Brian three days in a row? I would imagine they would just test Brian once and shoot your three scenes that, or your three episodes that day. Does right. it seem like it's doing that or are they testing? So if you work two days in a week, they're going to test you both days. So they're just, that's just, so nothing's really changed schedule wise. It's just, just the, the no blocking and replacing it with testing. Yeah. You get tested every time you go in cause your, your, your clearance. Cause then you're on the app too. There's an app that you have to fill out and get cleared through. So it's a questionnaire app and then you get, uh, a barcode that is only good for that day. Huh. <laughs> oh, wow. And your test is only good for that day because they don't know what you do when you go home, if you stop at the store, if you run into somebody, you know, they don't, because you're not in a bubble, you're, yeah. you're still living your life. You're supposed to watch where you go and not go out a lot, but you got to live your life. You got to do things. So do they do that with the entire cast and entire crew or... Do they not do crew because they're not that close to one another, I would assume? I don't know. I'm just curious. I, I know that there were reps from both unions, so I'm sure they have their own thing that they have to go through. I'm just not sure what it was. Mm -hmm. What they're doing. But I, I think they do get, they have to get screened. So yeah, they're getting tested. That's so crazy. Just to think of it being turned upside down like that. And, it's and like, the makeup room, you know, the makeup room is always so communal and everyone's just, it's a big party in there. It's all, you know, the barriers are up with, you know, the, what is the plexiglass is in between each station. So when you get into a station now, you're in a plexiglass box. So you can't talk to the person next to you because you're in a box. Oh my God! How, how's how's Nikki? And Armando, Armando's got like gloves on, face shield, mask. He's like got the thing up. He's got the full suit. He looks like he's going into surgery. And, <laughs> and there's only certain things he can do. He can't blow dry your hair because I that puts that stuff in the air. So and the only thing they can do is put product in your hair. Um, they can't blow dry your hair, and then there there's certain other makeups that they can't use. Oh my God. How's, how's Nikki um, handling all this? And for those of you who are listening, Nikki is the head of the makeup department. And uh, how would you explain Nikki and why it's funny for me to ask how he's handling this? Because he's just the talk of the, of the, of the town in there. He's, he's a talkative guy. He really is. He's, he really is. He, he doesn't like it at all. He's like, I don't know how to work in this environment. God's gets plastic, plexiglass everywhere. And everyone's, talking to him I'll just do it anyway and he talks to himself a lot so he's like I'll do it anyway but I don't have to like it and then Lauren looks at him like in a funny way like shut up and he's like what what I could say that I'm allowed to say that what what it's not pleasant in here I'm not pleasant behind this mask this doesn't make me feel good <laughs> I'm like Nick are you all right man he's like wow you are you only here a couple times I gotta go through this shit every day <laughs> my gosh true though not wrong yeah he's he's had enough he's had enough oh my god um well, well um, how you doing nick how you doing nick how you doing how, how do you think i'm doing to tell her how do you think i'm doing i'm sweating like a pig under here oh my goodness yeah he he uh nick he takes care of, he does the, the pizza Fridays and, and Nick, his whole entire, Nikki's entire diet is just uh, chicken Parmesan sandwiches and pizza. I don't think he's ever had a vegetable in his life. 
and just doesn't care. He likes eggplant. He'll eat eggplant. Oh, he eats eggplant. Like, I'll eat eggplant every now. I mean, it doesn't agree with me, but I'll eat it. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, well, Brian, we, I, I don't want to keep you. At the, I know we've been on for almost an hour and we appreciate your time. This has been an absolute blast. Yes. Um, I've had a great time. Great time. Yeah. You guys do a great show. This has been really fun. Oh, thanks, Thank Brian. You. Thank you. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, I'll hit you up in like a couple months if you're open to coming back on for that alien talk. Yeah. I would just oh love my God. to come to it. So that'd be fun. Dude, I have diagrams in my garage. I have posters that love I printed it. up. So I'll show you. I'll, yeah, I'm in. Just let me know. All right. Perfect, Sunny, dude. Sunny. Well, right. stay safe. Uh, enjoy uh, the rest of your day. And, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll keep in touch. And I'll talk to you yeah. soon. Thanks, guys. It was a pleasure. All right. Thanks, have dude. I'll uh, see you. Bye. Take care.